Good afternoon. We're going to begin our next panel now with John Chrisholm and Terry Anker. Uh, John Grisholm and Terry Anker will discuss the impact of regulation on entrepreneurship and how that affects economic freedom and prosperity. John Chrisholm has three decades of experience as an entrepreneur, CEO, and investor. I thought I said inventor. <laughs> uh, a pioneer in online marketing research. He founded and served as CEO slash chairman of Decisive Technology, now part of Google. Publisher of the first desktop, desktop and client server software for online surveys. Later, he founded and served as CEO chairman of Customer Sat, now part of Confirmit, and as a leading provider in enterprise and feedback management. Today, he is CEO of John Chris Home Ventures, a startup advisory and angel investing group. Um, he holds a BS and MS degree in electrical engineering and computer science from MIT and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Terry is the chairman of Anchor Consulting Group Incorporated. Uh, Terry Anchor has served as owner, advisor, and catalyst for businesses in a variety of in industries in the areas of executive management and matters of formation, acquisition of capital from public and private sources and efficient use of resources, automation, and integration of community mindedness. Terry has a BA in speech communication as well as a Juris Doctorate from Indiana University. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Terry and later John. All right, so first of all, I'm going to read this, not because I don't think you're worth me putting the energy into it of actually trying on my own. It's so that I'll actually get done so John has at least two minutes left to do his part, because if you wing it, it never ends well. I grew up on a farm in northern Indiana. I think this is a giant city. I'm like very excited to be here. Thanks for having me out. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Uh, green beers after this is over. Innovation is a natural consequence of the human condition. I was asked to talk today a little bit about this notion of innovation and whether government can assist uh, free enterprise. I'm gonna call it entrepreneurship, I think in some ways interchangeable. In order to survive, we rely upon innovation and we rely upon our intellect to stay alive. We've done that since the first humans sort of crawled out of the, out of the morass. I assume that most of us are good humans, we may be blind to our own self-interest, but we love our families, we care about our planet, and we generally seek goodwill to our fellow travelers. For the past 30 years or so, I founded and helped manage a, a scores of companies, as was man, managed. Uh, now the company invests in and helps startups or runs the companies we've already made. We employ a few hundred people. We meet customer needs every day. We create jobs. We pay lots of taxes in spite of what you might think. They're in software sales, we own print newspapers, we have development arm and real estate, we interact with government, banks, and just plain old humans, people who need stuff. The state of Indiana, where I live now, boasts a significant budget surplus, tons of money, gave a bunch of money back to the taxpayers, imagine that. Even in the Midwestern Rust Belt, it has somehow managed to stay ahead of all of these, you know, tax receipts and, and welfare commitments and federal mandates. But I can't say that it's always been that way in Indiana. In fact, Indiana was on the verge of utter financial collapse. Lenders were threatening to foreclose. What had once been a state that had in, a robust immigration uh, was reversing. Folks were moving across the border to Michigan or Illinois just to get away from what was looming as a giant tax increase on the horizon. Various counties and, and political and demographic factions were locked in a death match that was like the UFM. They hated each other. Senior elected officials went immediately to the halls of power in Washington, D.C. with their cup in hand, give us money you don't understand, market conditions screwed us, it's so unfair, it's so terrible, bail us out. Well, unfortunately, they were not successful. Their overlords in the imperial city 
said, no, no, thank you. We have problems of our own. You, Hoosiers, are on your own. Scores of political leaders had feathered the nests of their cronies. Even legitimate businesses had been enticed by promises of over market wages and all backed by government debt. The rail of the legislative body, faithful advocates who once bragged of their own superior intellect, now claimed that they'd been duped by unscrupulous rent seekers and demanded retribution, put the bastards in jail. Threats were made against those who had profited in the early days of this planned public-private partnership. Even those who seemingly earned their fees fairly fled the state, taking with them bales of tax dollars and leaving behind gads of incomplete projects. Now, when we look back, even with perfect hindsight, there are a few of you who study history in this room. Uh, we don't know exactly how it happened. How did the venture not move forward as it, planned? it was planned? As with most big government projects, there's never enough credit and always too much blame. We're talking about a works project that can only be outdone in its scope by the colossal nature of its failure. I'm talking about the Indiana Central Canal of 1837. It was intended to connect the Wabash and Erie Canal to the Ohio River. Everybody knows where that is. We're all good Midwesterners here. It's about 297 miles. It was a public-private infrastructure and economic development venture, but it almost ended the state in the very early days of its existence. How much would you guess got done of that 297 miles? Eight. Eight miles got done, and they spent almost 40% of the budget on eight miles. In debt and out of control, Hoosiers endure what we might call today austerity measures. Oh, woe is me, austerity measures. They were told to cut back. They changed the state constitution and dramatically pulled back from government-financed entrepreneurship. The canal-building entrepreneur might have found government at that time to offer quite an assist. But what about the other entrepreneur that didn't ask for support? didn't have political connections, or simply wanted to do something else on that same property, the kind of stuff that Dan was talking about earlier. Would she then rightly claim that government had become a formidable barrier to her success or even a direct competitor to her? Was she competing against herself as a taxpayer? And what happens to the former entrepreneur if administrations change and his model of success is built on rent seeking? Does he reinvent his company and the employees that work there, or does he simply fire them all and retire, as we've seen a lot of people do during COVID? Perhaps one might argue the only fair play alternative is for the well-intentioned and chaste government entrepreneur to build the canal themselves. No one can claim favorites if government is doing it themselves. Aside from the question that immediately forms in my mind is what the heck makes that person think that they're any better at building a canal than I would be? as an entrepreneur, I, it raises the question, is a, a, a taxpaying private sector developer being nudged out? If a private taxpaying developer won't build it, why? In the downside, the reason that government will often build it, they're saying that they're given special advantages, well, they have all of our money. That's one special advantage, certainly, but they have a second and significant advantage, as was evidenced in the Wabash and Erie Canal. No government leader suffered a loss. Someone might say, well, they lost their jobs. Indiana has term limits for high level executives. They couldn't get reelected anyway. They had 0% chance of staying in that office. Did they lose their pensions? Not a nickel. Did they have to pay back the debt that was owed by the state of Indiana? Only their share of taxes if they were paying taxes. The cronies suffered no loss. They took their cash and left. They were paid for services that they provided. If there was an adequate contract, perhaps they suffered under that. But claims of market failure often ter terrifically over are terrifically overstated to justify government intervention. In other words, a stadium won't be built unless I build it for you all. Well, that's not necessarily accurate. We don't know that. Prove that a money-making canal wouldn't be built without government money. I dare you to prove that it wouldn't be built. You could say that it hasn't been built, but you cannot prove that it won't be built. And that assumption is made all the time by our government leaders. When speculating who can claim credit for entrepreneurial success, 
some would openly assert that the individual entrepreneur didn't do that. You didn't do that. Even if one assumes this supposition, is it wise to, to articulate the claim that the government didn't do it either? Is a government official any smarter than any of you? And if you become a government official and you do not, does that somehow necessarily give you a, a, additional wisdom? No, it certainly gives you more money, but not necessarily additional wisdom. Moreover, unlike other businesses, government is rarely focused on a single standard or set of objectives. Interest groups will demand various concessions with little regard to the unintended consequences of the action. Bastia, which we were just talking about in the, hall, in the hallway, the seen and the unseen. Let's imagine governmental uh, leviathan China as our example. Eat all of your broccoli. There are children starving in, in China. That's what we heard when we were kids. It's hard to imagine a time when Chinese were, were, we were concerned about their financial status, but it did exist. And so we were encouraged to eat because we knew that that uh, that was our admonishment. The ravages of too much centralization had ensured that millions of Chinese live not only with food insecurity, as we call it here, but from abject starvation. Millions of Chinese starved every year because of centralized planning. Certainly government officials did not intend to start it, starve its people. That wasn't the plan, but the objectives of government control, saying we didn't fail, were more important than moving to a capitalist US-based system that produced an abundance of food, a lot of it here in Michigan. Fast forward a few decades, and we watched the Chinese ruling party loosen its grip on innovation and entrepreneurship. That ancient country lurched into stunning economic growth. Overall health, education, military might grew along with that capitalist awakening. Some celebrate the changes, others did not. Regardless of the point of view, China is now confronted with some of the same kinds of problems that we have, which is consumption and wealth and the incumbent leisure that comes along with wealth. So Chinese government officials, in reacting to that leisure, issued an executive order that those under 18 years of, old, years of age may not play video games during the week. Have you seen this? It's an order. Just, it's Trump or Biden saying, you people can no longer play video games until you're 18. Then, if you do, after 18, you may play one hour during the week and one hour per day on the weekends. Moreover, you must register with these authorities to receive government permission to play at all. I find this really stellar, especially considering you guys have like a pretty good video game program here, right? <laughs> I've heard a little tiny bit about it. Is that accurate? Yes. All right. So imagine if I said, I don't like that you win all the time because I suck at video games, so you can't play. And that's what's happening there. And what they said is it all comes as a part of a larger effort to protect the mental health of minors. Now tell me how that's innovative. It's an innovative policy, one could argue, but it's not innovation for video games. So what I would say instead is play your video games, read Adam Smith, surf the web without content restrictions. I'm afraid of what you're seeing on the web. Much of it's not true. Take my word for it because I put it there. <laughs> but you are free to do whatever you want. And the reason I say that is not for myself. But if drones, not hand-to-hand -hand combat, represent the future of warfare, having thousands of near professional Call of Duty players on hand, if there's ever a call to duty to defend ourselves, would be awesome. How much would you love that? They're playing one hour a week. There's probably people in this room that played one hour between the breaks uh, today. I think we'll win. Could that, could gaming, be another unintended dividend of freedom, of liberty, of innovation. Let's adapt, let's try new things. I hope so. Regardless, ha regardless, government has some overlapping objectives with innovation, but not a complete set. If government restricts access for women or minorities or any group to innovate, it may be serving some objective, but not innovation. So in other words, if a Saudi says a woman can't innovate, that may be what they choose to do, and that may be okay in that culture if they choose to, but it's not innovation. It's not allowing for that if you assume, as I do, that intelligence is distributed equally across gender and race and ide ideology, you're immediately taking out 50% of your innovation, of your, of your genius, by eliminating that set of the population. 
Alternatively, if innovators turn to government as an easy or necessary path to their objectives, how do they balance that cost? The pressure to undertake even more expansive and elaborate schemes from entrepreneurial government officials is intense, but no more so than the rent-seeking tendencies of guys like me inside the private sector who go, God, it would be a lot easier to take that $12 million to build the parking garage instead of financing it myself. Does collusion between these two forces destroy freedom? That's the question that I want you to think about. Does it reduce liberty? Maybe. But most importantly, does it curtail innovation rather than enhance it? Can a government leader who has no risk, no matter what they might say, experience the kind of risk that you will experience as an entrepreneur? And if they cannot experience the risk, can they understand innovation in the same way that you can? My instinct tells me no. Are we better served by a structure that keeps strictly to government its functions, whatever they may be, and we can debate that, and leaves to entrepreneurs the most open path, the least regulated, the least restrictive path to discovery and execution of innovation? That's what I think, and I hope that that's what you guys will find this weekend. Thank you. John Chisholm. Thanks so much, Terry. It is such a thrill to be here at Northwood University. I had no idea until I arrived here yesterday the extent to which Northwood is a hub for national free enterprise. Uh, Larry Reed, I didn't realize until, this, or, uh, until yesterday, the president of Foundation for Economic Education for me. Oh, oh, thank you. Uh, oh, the head of the economics department here. Uh, Mackinac Center was an outgrowth of Northwood. So it is a thrill to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And also, I'm getting lots of good advice from so many guys here and gals on uh, when to buy my next Lexus. So uh, thank you for that, too. Uh, threats to entrepreneurship and innovation and how to address them. I'm going to talk about uh, regulatory uh, threats and obstacles, of course. But before that, I want to talk about what I consider to be the biggest obstacle which is psychological. And I know we have a lot of aspiring entrepreneurs in this room. Um, if I think I don't have the skills, the knowledge, the relationships, the passion, the perseverance to start and grow my own business, I'm not gonna be able to do it even if I do have all of those resources. And if I believe I have those resources, I am going to be successful, even if I don't have it. So psychology is so important in entrepreneurship. And to uh, elaborate on that, uh, let me talk a bit about my own experience. For the last 40 years, I've lived in a very exciting place, Silicon Valley in Northern California. How many people have been to Silicon Valley? OK, many of us. Uh, it's full of uh, the northern end, North San Francisco, uh, Peninsula is, is full of companies like these. Uh, the main part, the older part of Silicon Valley, the, the mid-peninsula is full of companies like these. And amongst all of these companies, back in uh, the dot-com bust and boom of the 1990s and early 2000s, I was running a tiny little company called Customer Set. Uh, it, it deserves to be even smaller than that dot, but if I showed its actual size, you wouldn't be able to see it uh, relative to all of these giants. Uh, so this was the year of my life where I learned the most about entrepreneurship, business, and life. Uh, now, to set the stage, uh, the Internet first became commercially available and productized in the 1990s. Billions of dollars were invested and overinvested in the internet, uh, the companies like Yahoo, Google, uh, eBay, and others, were all, Amazon, were all founded during that period. That huge overinvestment collapsed in the first quarter of 2000 and 2001. That's known as the dot-com bust. Well, in the first quarter of 2000, 
uh, I would off, often, in 2001, I would often wake up in sweat-soaked sheets sticking to my skin. Our second round of financing, our Series B round, refused to close despite a flurry of meetings with investors as we ran out of cash. Those nights I would get up, shower off the sweat, and try to get back to sleep. When my management team and I finally realized that our Series B round was not going to close, we huddled to figure out what to do. Tens of thousands of companies, you understand, were going out of business all around us. First, we cut our own salaries, and then a few weeks later, those of all of our employees by 10%. I cut my own salary by 50%. Agonizing and debating over every individual, we laid off 40% of our workforce. 40% of the company I'd spent the last three years of my life building. When I assembled our remaining employees to explain to them that this was the only way we could stay afloat and stay together, I felt my composure collapsing and I broke down sobbing in front of our employees. They stood there stunned, sympathetic, and embarrassed that their CEO was crying in front of them. To help us get through, one of our investors lent me $300,000 for the company, but not to the company, for me to pass through to the company, meaning that I would be personally liable for repaying the loan. Later, I would repay that investor to whom, despite the arrangement, I was deeply grateful by mortgaging the townhouse that I lived in, in Menlo Park, California. Uh, to save on rent, we uh, consolidated in a less attractive second floor of our building and rented out the first ground floor to another startup. That startup came in late one weekend night, quit paying us rent after 60 or 90 days, cleared out all their belongings, and disappeared without a trace. We factored receivables. That was, we sold our future receivables for cash today uh, at a 20% discount, an expensive maneuver that you don't want to do routinely. Uh, I reduced my salary to the minimum wage, the legal limit. The nightmare would not end. Finally, we could see profitability ahead in the third quarter of 2001. And then, as you know, on September 11th, terrorists attacked the World Trade Center. The entire Northeast communications grid was down. It took an entire day just to confirm that all of our employees were still alive. Finally, the next day, I could announce all customer sat employees are safe. Even though we were 3,000 miles away from the terrorist attacks in Silicon Valley, even there, every company I know of had clients or customers who lost family members or uh, or uh, clients in the terrorist attacks. Uh, if the dot-com bust of 2000 and 2001 did not kill a company, almost certainly the terrorist attacks of September 11th did. Well, we did not make a profit in that third quarter of 2001. We did break even in the fourth quarter. The going kept tough for the next two to three years. We didn't hire a single new employee for 18 months. But we made it through, and the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Often I've wondered why did customer sat survive when so many other companies of our size and cohort, I think it's fair to say most other companies of our size and cohort failed. I absolutely don't think we were smarter than other management teams. We, didn't, we absolutely didn't have more in the way of resources than other management teams. Customer sat only raised $2.94 million in its entire life. Uh, one of our clients, Webvan, famously raised $75 million before its IPO, then $300 million in its IPO, and then declared bankruptcy 14 months after its IPO. So we didn't have more in the way of resources than other companies did. If I had to distill it down to just two factors, I would say it was these. Number one, we cared more deeply about our business than other management teams did, about all aspects of it, of the coolness of our products, about the relationships we had with our customers, and about each other on our team than other management teams did. And two, we stuck with it longer than others did. As I mentioned, it was another seven years before the company was acquired in the first quarter of 2008. Many other companies just gave up and threw in the towel before that.
So in short, it was this combination of passion and perseverance that got us through. The very same passion and perseverance that you can invoke to make your auto re retail dealerships or other businesses a success. Uh, we hear a lot about passion these days. Every business book talks about passion. That's starting to get boring. Some businesses also talk about perseverance. That's more interesting. No one is talking about how the two reinforce each other and form a positive feedback loop. Passion is an attitude, perseverance is a behavior, and in many aspects of our lives, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other and form a feedback loop, either positive or negative. You know how when you stick with something long enough, so you start to get better at it and start to like it, and then start to really get good at it and then start to love it, that's an example of perseverance driving passion. Conversely, if you're already passionate about an activity, you know how the hours can go by like minutes when you're involved in that activity. That's an example of, of, of passion enabling perseverance. So you can see how the two form a positive feedback loop. And if you can think of any aspect of your life where you have experienced that positive feedback between passion and perseverance, it's probably a really good area to consider starting a business. I think of uh, passion and perseverance as broadly analogous to the north, south, and east, west axes if you're trying to climb this mountain. If you can only move along one axis, it may be impossible to find a path that takes you all the way to the top. But if you have the flexibility to move along either of those axes, you can find a path that will take you all the way to the top. That's broadly analogous to how passion and perseverance, perseverance together work together and reinforce each other. Outstanding performance in any realm reflects passion and perseverance working together, whether it's art, sports, academia, entrepreneurship, you name it. Uh, and it's not just passion and perseverance, but in many areas of our life, our attitudes and behaviors reinforce each other. Uh, so, you know, we often think, I'm not feeling very enthusiastic today, and so I'm not acting very enthusiastic. But the fact is, if we just start to act enthusiastically, we will start to feel enthusiastically. So there is a positive feedback loop between enthusiasm, uh, behavior, and feeling. Same with honesty. Uh, the best way to become uh, uh, honest is to act honestly each and every day. Uh, same with loyalty, same with courage. I find it really inspiring to think there's nothing, absolutely nothing, that differentiates someone who is truly courageous from somebody who merely consistently acts courageously. I can act courageously today. I can act courageously tomorrow. You know what? That's a really inspiring thought. I can be courageous. I can be honest. I can be loyal. Just by acting that way, I can become that way. Now. Let me get to the psychology. We are, we are subjected to lots of forces each and every day that are discouraging us from taking initiative and taking risks. Uh, former President Obama's famous statement, you didn't build that. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, how unhelpful, how counterproductive uh, to not give credit to people for what they've done. Fear-mongering is a discouragement that we're exposed to everywhere, every day. Wear your mask, use hand sanitizer, get vaccinated, you know, don't stay at home. Uh, uh, generating fear is a way of creating power for ourselves or whoever is generating the fear, isn't it? Because if I can scare you into doing something, I have some power over you. Uh, you know, we uh, members of the community aren't as likely to uh, cause ripples and waves if uh, we're scared into doing things. These are the. This is why I say uh, uh, psychology is the key obstacle to entrepreneurship that we need to be cautious of and aware of. Threats and censorship of free speech and expression. Don't say that and so forth. Don't think that. So. Uh, what can we do to counteract this? 
Well, an exercise that I think is really helpful uh, and valuable for anyone, whether you plan to start your own business or not, is to create what I call your stars chart. What do I mean by stars? I mean your skills, the technologies that you know about, your assets and achievements, your relationships, your reputation, and your strengths as in inner strengths. It spells the word stars with two A's and two R's. And regardless of where you are in life, a really worthwhile exercise, take out a big sheet of paper, put seven columns on it, one for each of those words, or use a spreadsheet like Excel and make seven columns in Excel, put one of those words at the top of each column, and write down as best you can every, all of the resources that you have under each of those uh, categories and look at it. Here's, here's, a, here's an example. Uh, so uh, skills and technologies are those that you've learned both because you're passionate about them and because you formally studied them. Assets could be financial, physical, or knowledge-based. Accomplishments are there to build your confidence. Relationships are both personal and professional. Reputation, how other people know you. Strengths, inner strengths, qualities like courage, creativity, passion, perseverance, and so forth that you've demonstrated. Put them all down. Uh, this is a tremendously useful chart for reminding yourself of all of the resources that you have to bear and can draw on. Uh, in the book, uh, Unleash Your Inner Company, there's a copy here. Someone will win it. Uh, before the end of the day. Uh, we use this chart in four different ways uh, for trying to figure out what's the ideal business for you to start. We use it to assess the fit between you and each of the unsatisfied customer needs that you're considering to satisfy. Two, to see where the gaps are, what additional resources you need to develop or acquire. Three, to build your self-confidence. Uh, and then four, to innovate. And let me just say a word about innovation next and using this chart to innovate. Now, some people have the idea that you have to be born an innovator to be an innovator. I don't buy that at all. Anyone and everyone, everyone in this room can be an innovator just by combining things you already know in novel ways. Uh, and in fact, the STARS chart is a tremendous uh, resource for doing that. Uh, the light bulb, for example, we tend to think of a single thing, but it's actually a combination of other technologies, the filament expo enclosure, vacuum and base, and so forth. Well, similarly, your STARS chart gives you all the resources that you know, and you can look at different combinations of them and try to find a combination that you can uniquely satisfy. No one else has your exact set of STARS, do they? It would be extremely unlikely. Uh, and so uh, here's a customer need, a English-Spanish translation that might be addressed uniquely by this person because they know something about chemistry, they worked in medical services, and uh, they, uh, they have conversational Spanish. Here's another one, same-day home delivery of prescription drugs. They know their hometown. Uh, they've worked in medical services, and they know something about GPS. So uh, it's a useful tool uh, for innovation. Uh, the, the most important resources on your STARS chart uh, for becoming an innovator are the new skills and technologies. Uh, so if there are two new technologies that are both growing, they may or may not overlap. That is, there may or may not be any products or services currently that use both of them. But if you know both of them, uh, th you could be uh, the first or at least early on to address a customer need that can use both of them. And uh, if these two big circles are growing, the intersection will start out small, but will grow even faster. If you can meaningfully apply a third technology, that intersection will grow faster still. So uh, again, these harbor particularly good uh, opportunities for innovation. So I encourage everyone to track as best you can the new technologies that are at either central to or adjacent to whatever area you're interested in working in. So what are some ways to build your self-confidence and willingness to take risks? Uh, well, deliberately expanding every day in some way beyond your comfort zone, whatever that might be might be learning a new sport or a new skill or a new technology. 
uh, adopt any of many positive human potential techniques. And there are so many good books out there. I'd welcome hearing about what books you recommend on positive thinking. I'm a great fan of Dale Carnegie, who wrote the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. View whatever you genuinely can't change about yourself as an asset. When I was in my mid-30s, I accepted the fact that I'm gay. How can that be an asset? Well, it is an asset as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it's helped me think outside the box. It's made me sensitive to uh, the challenges that other minorities face. Think about yourself and what's unique about you that you cannot change. How can you view it as an asset? and uh, read inspirational books like the ones shown here. The best book I've ever read. How many people here have heard of Atlas Shrugged, the novel by Ayn Rand? Many of us, great. It is a tremendously inspirational book. Uh, we, we so often hear uh, what I call entrepreneurship theater, which is governments giving grants to winning startups, incentivizing target industries, short-term tax incentives, even elevator pitch and business plan pitch competitions where people learn how to pitch, but not how to start businesses. Uh, these all have primarily short-term and PR benefits. Often the politics conflicts with the economics. You know, uh, the winning startup is chosen because it's, uh, you know, good at DEI or uh, it, it's green or something, whether or not it's likely to be viable. Uh, and these are mostly irrelevant to the hard, real work of creating lower tax and friendly regulatory environments, which is what the, the uh, governments should be focused on. Okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the psychological obstacles to entrepreneurship and innovation. And again, each and every one of us here has the potential to be an entrepreneur and an innovator. Let's talk about the regulatory obstacles. I started my first company in 1992. My second company in 1997, my third company in 2013. In most ways, over the last <clears throat> 20 years, starting a business has gotten easier. Uh, we've got the internet now. We didn't have that back in 1992. We can find suppliers. We can find customers. We can market ourselves. We can outsource entire functions that. We couldn't previously outsource. If you, if uh, HR or finance or whatever is not the primary focus of your business, not your strategic value added, you can outsource that, find someone to handle it for you. Uh, software development platforms are much more powerful today than they were 20 years ago. Uh, you know, it, uh, 20 years ago, it might have taken a team of a dozen software developers uh, that would have taken uh, only uh, five or six software developers. Uh, today, it might take only one or two software developers. I remember way back in the 1990s, what a challenge it was just to develop a website that could take a credit card online. That was a big deal 20 years ago. Now, of course, it's, it's trivial. Any software development platform has that capability. So in most respects, virtually every respect, starting a business, in my view, has gotten easier over the last 20 years. Uh, there are many more opportunities now. There are many more products and services on the market. So there are many, uh, and each of those products and services creates needs around it. So you could potentially make it smarter, better, faster, help the companies that are providing those services. Uh, only in one regard has it gotten harder to start a business, in my experience, and that is regulatory compliance. Uh, you know, my favorite ex example is worker status law. You could used to easily be able to hire a contractor for as many days or weeks as uh, hours or days per week as you needed him or her uh, to program or to do whatever task. And then as you grew, as your resources grew, your demands grew, you could hire that person for more and more hours and then eventually bring them on as an employee. Uh, it made starting a startup with limited cash and resources possible. Now it is much harder uh, because of various rules that I could talk about, worker status law. In many cases, those contractors have to be viewed as an employee, in which case you're responsible for uh, unemployment compensation, insurance, health benefits, and so forth, uh, all of which add overhead and cost for, to the entrepreneur. Uh, and uh, this may be for an employee who's only working a few hours a week. 
to justify that somebody is a, a contractor rather than an employee, you may have to fill out a six-page form. One small example of how regu regulatory compliance has gotten, made it harder over the years. Uh, there's uh, the number of new businesses created for every 10,000 working age Americans has declined over the last decades from 27 to 25 to 22 to the current decade, I don't know, probably somewhere in the high teens, according to this data. And uh, so this bell curve represents uh, whatever measure of entrepreneurs you want, skills, amb ambition, passion, perseverance, you name it. Whatever measure you want to uh, use for entrepreneurs, there will be some number, an increasing number on the low end who are uh, being barred. Uh, incidentally, uh, there's a similar curve for minimum wage. Uh, you know, maybe the minimum wage seems like a good idea, but uh, most young people are here uh, in terms of skill and experience among employees. And if the minimum wages are here, these people are going to be out of work. And what does that mean? That means that uh, the entry level positions where you start to gain experience aren't available to those people. So it's harder to climb that hill. It actually contributes to growing inequality, the fact that we have a minimum wage, because these people are all left behind. Uh, it, uh, uh, it routes investment into software and automation, because if I can't, uh, if it's if the minimum wage is here, and this, what what people uh, uh, are worth to me in terms of their hourly rate is less than that, I'm going to invest in software and robots instead to avoid that. We've seen, uh, uh, you know, McDonald's and other fast food restaurants putting in automated systems. How sad that they're spending capital on that when they could be hiring many young people who would welcome that early stage work experience. Uh, a similar curve uh, applies to entrepreneurs overall. Regulations in all of these different areas, I won't elaborate on them now, but there are, they are steadily uh, uh, encroaching and, and getting more and more challenging. And so a, a larger and larger number of uh, low experience, less skilled and experienced entrepreneurs are are being shut out. You know, I especially think about people who are new to the United States, have limited English speaking skills, how difficult it would be for them to navigate the uh, legal uh, obstacles and regulatory obstacles. Here's a graphical way of thinking about how regulations limit opportunities. Let's say that this cube represents a big, huge market opportunity, and all of these purple dots represent a business somewhere in that opportunity. They can spread out. They're not uh, competing with each other directly. They can find customer needs that aren't being addressed uh, by others. Now let's say a regulation, a first regulation comes along and disallows activity in the right side of that box. Okay, well now all of these uh, companies have to squeeze into a smaller area, and uh, there's less opportunity for entrepreneurship and innovation. And what had been a very big win-win uh, environment where people are not directly competing with each other, now is turning into a tighter environment. Think of trying to squeeze uh, a thousand animals uh, into a tall, smaller and smaller space, they're going to be competing with each other, aren't they, and at each other's throats. It's becoming a lose-lose, negative-sum environment. Another regulation comes along, makes it even more extreme, still another regulation, and, and, and so forth. Not only that, but as the regulations evolve over time, what had been a flat surface, where it's very clear what's allowed and not allowed becomes a more and more irregular surface that takes time and money to explore, advantaging the well-connected, well-funded, and influential, as we've seen from earlier talks today. Uh, think of the more than 100,000 startups that are squeezed into the health and fitness mobile app space. Most of those startups will not make it. Just too many startups squeezed into too small a market space. Well, uh, health and fitness mobile apps are relatively un 
regulated as compared to finance and medical and transportation and building and so forth, which is why so many entrepreneurs are attracted there. The barriers to entry are low, uh, the regulatory barriers to entry, the uh, uh, and if just a few of those entrepreneurs could be freed up to compete in a much larger space in all of those other areas, uh, humanity would advance more rapidly and uh, we wouldn't, and many more entrepreneurs would be successful. Uh, this is a beautiful example of what I'm talking about. You know, Amazon for years now has wanted to deliver products and services by by drone to your home, uh, but uh, they can't do it because of uh, regulations. Uh, Amazon's no-fly zone delivery largely grounded despite a flashy launch because of regulation. So how, what is the right way to design regulations? Let me offer some thoughts on that. Uh, number one, make them responsive, not prescriptive. What do I mean by that? I mean, they only come into play if there's a dispute that needs to be resolved. If two people aren't going to court over a problem, there's no issue there. Uh, it's invoked in the case of a dispute. Focus on the objectives, not the specifications. Uh, you know, currently drones are very tightly controlled, uh, only up to 400 feet, uh, well away from an airport, that's understandable. Uh, but a uh, dedicated operator, only one operator per drone, daylight hours only, only within visual sight of the operator. Those are ridiculous limitations that mean that, uh, that effectively cut off the commercial applications for drones. Drones could be being very useful. They could be painting the second stories of our houses. They could be going over farmland to identify uh, where there needs to be water of crops. I, I, I could, they could be used to help identify people who uh, need to be saved from catastrophic events, um, but they're not being used uh, for many of those applications. Uh, start with the objective. The objective is that drones must be operated safely. Okay, let people figure out how to do that. Uh, you know, it means they have to be able to land safely and not destroy property if they run out of juice and, and so forth. They have to avoid other drones and other obstacles. Start general and evolve to specificity over time. Over time, drones will likely gain the ability to sense and avoid other objects. Great, automatically. Uh, as that happens, then that could become part of the regulation. But don't limit the use of drones uh, prematurely uh, because that technology hasn't been avoided yet. And provide large spaces for learning and freedom. Drones may operate up to 400 feet, for example, would uh, uh, enable lots of experimentation and discovery. Here, here's some more uh, on this. Test on a small scale first. Uh, you know, if possible, choose a geographical area or some other area where the regulation applies and not in another area. This serves two purposes. One is it lets us see whether or not it works, and two, it sees how much uh, we're giving up by comparing the two if the uh, regulation does not apply to an area. Reserve places where they do not apply, okay, to ensure continued innovation and to better assess the impact of regulation. Require innovation impact assessments. You know how we require environmental impact assessments for real estate development projects? How about innovation impact assessments of regulations? It's a lot harder. It's trying to anticipate what innovations is this likely to squelch uh, with this regulation. Let me give you an example. Um, there's, uh, you know how many sidewalks have ramps for, um, for wheelchairs and other vehicles. It's a very practical thing. However, there is a cost. Uh, the cost is, uh, uh, investment in prosthetics that are intelligent and wheelchairs that are intelligent that can climb stairs, go over uh, curbs and, uh, and smart prosthetics that enable people to walk on their own without using ramps. And there will always be cases where ramps are not available. So let's be aware that when we uh, do that uh, rule that there have to be ramps that uh, were negatively impacting 
demand for and innovation for and investment in smart prosthetics. Limit the number of words and pages of the regulation. If it's more than 100 pages, people aren't going to read it. They won't be able to anticipate all the unintended consequences. And use sunset clauses. That is, a sunset clause says this regulation expires after n years, five years, 10 years, whatever. Circumstances change. Let it, let it end automatically. If it's still applicable five or 10 years from now, great. Let it be explicitly renewed by the congressional body. And create New Hampshire's. What do I mean by New Hampshire? Well, New Hampshire is the state of the 50 US states that ranks the freest on the Cato Freedom of the 50 States uh, Index. So uh, aim for things like the lowest tax rates, the lightest regulation, the most efficient administration. Don't try to pick and attract winners. We're the markets are ecosystems. Uh, they evolve. They're not designed from the top down. Uh, just create an attractive environment for all entrepreneurs and industries, and some of them will be successful. You, it's, it's, if, if we could predict which ones were going to be successful in advance, we'd all be billionaires and all the in innovations would already be here. Adopt and promote patience in a long-term view. And, and for each jurisdiction, your jurisdiction, wherever you insist that you be the best and the freest. Thank you so much for having me. Questions, Both comments? You, if you could take the chairs and I'll take another microphone and um, okay. have time for a couple of questions. Uh, maybe I can start with something and then let uh, whoever of the students have had the chance to ask a question or, or the rest of the audience do so. Um, you are explaining to us all the ways in which politics is messing up the uh, job of the entrepreneur to serve the customer, to create new stuff, to generate wealth, to make life better in so many different ways. I wonder if uh, you have any thoughts on how entrepreneurs being much more innovative than governments, although they don't have uh, monopoly over using coercion, but is it possible that entrepreneurs have uh, some kind of a way of counter-striking, a way of putting politics down, uh, of, of freeing up the potential of the people? How do, we, how do we utilize that potential? Entrepreneurs, can they be fighting back? What's the way? I mean, if politics can use coercion against you and you can't use coercion, what's the way for you to defend our rights and freedoms? Uh, in my book, I give the example of a nine-year-old boy who successfully overturned a regulation in his town. Uh, it was, uh, do you know what little libraries are? Little libraries are a little library on a post that you can have in your front yard or something. These were disallowed in his hometown anyway. He didn't like that. Uh, admittedly, he did get some help from his dad, but he started a social media campaign and he spoke in front of the town council and by golly, he got that overturned. So if a nine-year-old boy can do it, you and I can do it too. Uh, so th that's one thing. Realize that, that you can do it, you know, enlist your friends, your fellow entrepreneurs. There's no one else to do it but us. Um, there are lots of organizations, Institute for Justice, Foundation for Economic Education, the Northwood Freedom Seminar Series, the Free Market Roadshow that we're part of today, uh, and, and many others uh, that uh, promote entrepreneurship uh, and, and freedom. And so support these organizations. As, as I do. So how many of you have siblings? Older or younger? Younger? Older? So when you're the younger one, you get beat up on by the older one. When you're the older one, you beat up on the younger one until they get big and they fight back. And then you got to figure out whether you can improve and keep up with them or you walk away and say, I'm not going to play anymore. It's very interesting because my oldest son, five years older than his brother, is taller than I am. 
my younger son is way taller than he is. And there was a there was a reset that occurred twice. Once when they were about 17, he had the height but not the, the bulk. Once when he was about 21, they had a reset. It was time to look at each other in a different kind of a way. So the question that you ask is, is, is how do we interact with this natural inclination of government? I, I don't think these are bad guys. Like I said at the beginning, I, you know, they love their kids. They buy ice cream for, I don't know, their dog or whatever people do that are nice. And, and they're, they're trying, but they get caught up in this idea that they're, tr that, that they're going to help in the same way that my older son thought that he was helping my younger son. And at some point, my younger son said, you got to leave me alone and let me do this on my own because I'm going to be better for it. Many years ago, somebody was talking about, uh, I was in D.C., and they said, you don't care, you business people. I love it when people say, you people. You don't care about people. I'm like, that's not true. I care about people as much or more than you do. The difference is my children could live in my house for the rest of their lives and have a nominally good life. It's a nice house. They would be protected. They'd get food. Somebody would replace the toilet paper when it ran out, you know, the kind of things that happen. And they would turn out to be terrible human beings, just terrible. And so there's some balance about how do you nudge people into working a little harder. And when you think about this relationship with government, it's so freaking easy to take advantage, and it's so tempting. But at the same time, know that the minute that you take advantage, You've sacrificed your ability to be better ever than that moment when you took advantage. Does that make sense? Next question. Um, um, I was at, more so wondering for like uh, from your perspective, John. Uh, I know your backgrounds at um, Silicon Valley, and then obviously with the whole situation going on with Silicon Valley Bank. Um, what's your perspective on them going under? The bailout that's happening, do you think that that's the right move, the wrong move? Because obviously you're coming from a perspective of a uh, small business owner at the very beginning having your own tech uh, startup. And that's obviously a wide, wide majority of them were tech startups. Um, so like, what's your whole perspective on that whole situation going on? And two of my companies used Silicon Valley Bank as our principal bank. When you're talking about Silicon Valley Bank, I feel like I should move away. <laughs> maybe, that's why, maybe that's why Dan asked me about uh, bankruptcy early on, <laughs> chapters 7 and 11. Uh, and, and at that time, at least, it was kind of a badge of honor to use Silicon Valley Bank as your bank. Uh, I see problems on both the regulatory side and the management side. I don't think the problem is can wholly be placed at the feet of one or the other. Uh, uh, the, manage, man, the, the management team there did some foolish things. They bought a lot of long-term uh, bonds uh, to up their return a bit, uh, but that's not prudent to do that with short-term funds. And uh, so, so that was really imprudent. Uh, but, and also there's, it is true that uh, there was some uh, regulation that extended, I believe, down to banks that had assets of 50 billion or greater that was relaxed to 250 billion or greater during the Trump administration. And uh, Silicon Valley Bank fit between those two numbers. And so prior to the relaxation of that regulation, uh, they were, uh, they had a uh, deposit uh, and, and reserve requirements that they were no longer required to have after the regulation was relaxed. And arguably that, that was a factor as well. Uh, but let me tell you about another factor that we just, people are not talking about that I think is important. Uh, and it's basically both fiscal and monetary policy on the part of the federal government, on the part of the Fed, Interest rates, rates, as you know, were artificially low for many years, both before and after uh, the financial crisis of 2008. 
And uh, there was great uh, deficit spending has been over the last four to six years or longer, which drove the inflation that resulted in or was a key driver of the inflation that we've seen in the last year or two. And so the Fed was forced to raise interest rates much further and much faster this last year or two than they would have normally been required to do. And so that created a, a really, uh, that manipulation of the interest rates created an uncertain environment that uh, ultimately caused the long-term bonds that Silicon Valley Bank bought to lose value very quickly. And so they had to make up a loss of $1.8 billion. They tried to cover that by raising uh, $2 billion in capital. They did not do a good job of explaining their situation as, as being short-term. People got spooked, and that led to the run on the bank. Uh, but I think it's significant that the, the manipulation of interest rates and the huge deficit spending that caused the need to raise interest rates so rapidly was also a factor in this. And it, we really would be better off if, I believe, if interest rates were allowed to find their own equilibrium and uh, uh, be controlled by the market rather than by a team of a dozen uh, governors, uh, Federal Reserve governors. Uh, because whenever you concentrate decision making in a small group of people, like a dozen governors, no matter how well trained, no matter how well educated, no matter how much data they have at their disposal, they're going to make mistakes and they're going to have biases that will lead to the wrong decision making. The way to avoid that is by having tens of millions or hundreds of millions of decision makers. And how do you achieve that? Through markets. Uh, so I agree with uh, Dan Mitchell, or who said earlier, uh, who referred to the creation of the Federal Reserve in 1913. Or I, well, it was uh, actually he was referring to the, the income tax um, uh, as as a mistake. And and uh, I wish we could allow markets. In fact, here's a challenge for you, the next generation of entrepreneurs. Try to find a way to steer our great country towards returning to a, a financial system in which markets determine interest rates rather than a small group of elite individuals. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, we have very little time, so go grab some refreshments, bring them back, and we have the final panel starting in five. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.